Oh, welcome to the old classic car channel. Now the plan today is to go and take the trusty old jerry can into town and fill it up with fuel because on Sunday it is the Hopley House Farm Shop Classic Car Meeting, Sunday morning meet. So uh, you may remember in the video towards the end of 2022 we actually took the Renault 4CV on its very first out outing shortly after we bought it. Um, but the plan for Sunday is to take the little Dodge pickup truck instead. So uh, I want to get some fuel in it. I don't want to be faffing around stopping getting fuel on the way to the meeting on Sunday morning. I just want to head straight over there. So I thought I need to nip into town anyway. So we'll take the jerry can with us. And it seemed like an excellent opportunity to give the Ford Anglia a run. It's a lovely sunny day today for some reason. It's a bit chilly. Um, so that lack of heater will be noticed. But yeah, it's a great opportunity to give the Ford a little run. And we will get some fuel for this to put in this and then we'll be all set to go nice and early on Sunday morning. back at base now and several gallons of fuel here all ready and waiting to go into the Dodge pickups all we need to do now is bring that out top up the fuel tank and swap them over all ready for Sunday morning well morning everyone and uh, well best laid plans and all that uh, it's all fueled up and ready to go but it won't go it won't start for some reason I'm not quite sure what's going on whether it's fuel related or ignition, I'm not quite sure. So I think we need a little session of uh, just checking things over and see if anything that's happened with it just being sat for a little while is causing it to be reluctant to fire up this morning. I'm not quite sure why it would be. Occasionally it is a bit slow to catch, um, but it always always seems to catch. But for some reason this time, um, when we need it to run, it didn't actually start. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. So I think I'll have to check on well, the ignition side, which is down here. And the fuel side which is over there so uh, but for now because it's on six volt um the battery was starting to wane and as soon as it starts turning over slowly you haven't got a hope of it starting so we'll leave that on charge but the problem is obviously we're meant to be going off to this uh, farm shop meeting the anglia and the 4cv are down there blocked in by this and i don't want to roll this out because there's no guarantee that i'll get it running later and to push it back up the slope here is a bit of an ask. We can push it in and maybe pull it in on the starter with it in gear just to get it over the hump into the garage but I don't really want to be messing around like that so I think we're going to have to see if we can persuade the standard into life and the yieldy dodgy number two will have to stay here unfortunately which is a bit of a shame but these things are sent to try us and that's the life of owning old vehicles as uh, anyone who owns old vehicles will know themselves all too well but yeah a bit of a shame but never mind so harley's going to move that out of the way let's see if this can be persuaded into life well we've given it a quick rinse over just to make sure it doesn't look too bad for, for turning up at a little car gathering and uh yeah we weren't expecting to take the standard but um this is the hopefully the faithful backup so we'll see how we get on with this one Well, folks, we've made it. We're next to the 635 CSI, a lovely BMW Coupe of the 1980s. Various cars are turning up. Granddad's already here. Dad's already here in his MGB GT. We've got a 1275 GT. Very nice, too. Lovely A35. We've seen that one before at Crew Heritage. MGB Roadster. What a cracking day, the weather is just glorious today. What a fantastic Sunday morning this is. Yeah, clearly MGBs are going to be well represented here today. I'm not quite sure what that modified one is over there. I think we'll have to have a closer look at that. Not quite sure what, but we will have a look in a minute. We've got a couple of old Land Rovers rolling in. 
lovely daffodils too. Yeah. I have a feeling that this TVR featured in the TVR photo compilation I put together not that long ago. If you've not seen that yet, please check out some of the other videos on the channel because there's quite a lot going on now. Down to him cleaning his engine by the look of it. Yeah, this is a lovely little two-door A35. Look at that. I'm glad I didn't park the standard next to that because this is in fantastic condition. Rivals back in the day, of course. This was 948cc. And the standard 10 was 948cc, but the standard 8 had to do with a mere 803. Now, what's going on under the bonnet of this? We've got flared wheel arches and a monster of a V8 engine. Looks like a Rover V8. This is a converted car, it's not a factory built car. Got a very racy fuel filler cap there. BGT V8. Well, I bet that goes well. There's that Series 2 or 2A Land Rover rolling by. Series 1. But yeah. This is super clean under the bonnet of this one. There's the Lotus Cortina Mark 1, that's an early car pre-airflow. I did a feature on this one at one of the Crew Heritage videos a year or two back. It's a beautiful, beautiful car. Doesn't come out all that often, but yeah, it's kept in incredible condition, this one. There's a Volvo 144. That brings back memories to, for me and Dad, because he had a 144S back in the late 1970s. Yeah, what a cracker this is. Twin Webbers. Wow. I like the FOMO Co. Ford Motor Company sticker on the wiring loom over there. Oh, that's a lovely car. Lovely, lovely car. There's a very shiny presentable Mark 1 MX-5 here. Maybe we should have brought ours after all. We've got another one here. It's a shame we didn't get a Dodge pickup here today, but never mind, the standard's doing a good job of standing in. I can't imagine there'll be any other standards here today, but I'm willing to be proven wrong. And there's that rare four-wheel version of the old Bond bug. I remember speaking to the owner of that last time we were here, late in 2022. There was a batch of those converted, I think it was in the 1980s, but there are very few of them left now. Got an Elise arriving over there, but let's have a look here. We've got a Sunbeam Alpine. I believe the owner of this car has had it like 50 or so years, which is a, must be something of a record, but yeah. Let's have a quick peek inside. <laughs> Doctor No. Of course, one of these featured in the film first of the James Bond films next to that just showing the kind of contrast that you get at these breakfast meetings it's, um, like I say this is at Hopley House the farm shop on the way to Middlewich a glorious Ford Model A coupe or coupe two door coupe what a beautiful car that is if you're thinking of getting a vintage car you could do a lot worse than a Model A because they're so well supported the, what you find is the older you go with cars quite often the more difficult it is to find spare parts just to keep the things running but Model A's like Austin 7's I suppose but Model A's are really well supported and you've got a you've got a choice of suppliers for parts in this country let alone in America so uh, if you want a well relatively painless um, journey into the, the world of vintage cars you could do a lot worse than a Ford Model A I mean this is a two-door coupe you've got two-door saloons four-door saloons or sedans um, you've got Taurus you've got little pickup trucks vans and then you've got the larger Model AA trucks which are based on the same engine but heavier duty running gear and that's what we had until a year or two back but yeah 
Model A's are just fantastic cars. Next to that, we've got a TR4A. You can tell it's a 4A instead of a 4 because of the, uh, the lamps on the side of the wings there. So this means it's a TR4A has got independent rear suspension as opposed to the solid rear axle. I can hear something coming in and it looks like another Mark 1 Cortina. So we've got this wonderful Lotus Cortina here. This is quite an early car and this is a later one. So that's an airflow Cortina, this isn't is it? The airflow GT this is. Yeah, so it's yeah. a GT on a 66 yeah. plate. Beaver again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Apologies for the shadows, the sun's quite low at this time of day, at this time of year. That looks really purposeful. The Vauxhall Viva, the HC Viva. Nice RAC badge on the front. I think we saw this one at Crew Heritage the other day, didn't we? Anyway, where was I? TR4A, lovely. Aftermarket seats with integral headrests. Makes it a little bit safer and it's got the, the Surrey roof, a bit like the Porsche Targa. You've got a lift out panel and you stow that, I presume, behind the seat somewhere. So it's like having a hard top, but you can remove parts of it when the weather is like it is today. So it's the best of both worlds, really, in here. We've got a rubber bumper MGB GT. And there's the, uh, the Vauxhall Sports hatch. That's a rare beast, that is. So we've got the rubber bumper MGB here. We've got a, I assume it's a Shadow 2. These are growing on me more and more as the years roll by. This is the Shadow 2 with a slightly larger, chunkier bumpers and slightly improved yep shadow this is also the wraith as well which was like a slightly rarer version with the the everflex roof but yeah this is a shadow to the shadow one had just chrome bumpers this has the larger chrome and rubber insert bumpers but there's not a huge difference between them and this is that lovely roads that we saw coming in before all right then we'll skip past this modern metal and see what's parked up over at the back there it's always good to see this Mark II Triumph 2000 turn up. Lovely car, this appears at many, many local classic car shows, meets, breakfast meets and so on. And I do like these. One of these would definitely be on the shortlist for a, a regular user classic. Very practical classic car, this is roomy, spacious, lots of room. Plenty of grunt either with a 2 litre or the 2.5 engine. You can even have an automatic if you wish, but the, the jewel for me would be a 2.5 manual estate. If I found one of those for a reasonable fee or price and in decent condition, I wouldn't want a ropey one, but um, if I found a nice estate, I'd be very, very tempted indeed. Don't those two look good together, parked up, obviously very related to each other, very close relatives. Four-door HC Viva and the, the racy, the sporty looking sports hatch. The rear body is similar to that. Well, I think it's the same as the uh, the Viva HC Estate, but the front with that droop snoot is a very different animal indeed. Yeah, it's a, such a rare car. The newest arrival is a 66 Lotus Elan. Okay, over here on the back row we've got the brace of Land Rovers, like I say Series 2 or 2A, I'm guessing actually by the, if that's the original registration, I'm guessing that's a 2A. And the Series 1 here, complete with many adornments on the grill. <laughs> it's a super clean little Land Rover that is, well they both are to be honest, but those rear lights are from a minivan or pickup I suspect and probably an improvement on the originals that would have been fitted next to it is a BM, uh, the Volkswagen a VW it's a 1302 S apparently uh, overheard someone telling me and the, the, the badge on the boot there confirms it so these these had the I mean later Beetles did have much larger lights than that and this has got the flat screen the curvier front of the later Beetles but it's still got the flat windscreen later ones I think went to a curvy screen but 
correct me if I'm wrong, I don't really know VW Beetles all that well. And there's that four-door GT Cortina, lovely machine. And this is that MGB Roadster that came in before, sounded very purposeful. Really nice car. I don't think that's the original colour, is it? certainly suits it, but I don't think that's an original shade of blue. It's a metallic colour, but yeah, really suits it. This MX-5 that came in before, this is, well, technically it's a Yunos Roadster. This would be a Japanese market car that's been imported in more recent times. Our second MX-5 was a Yunos Roadster. We had two red Mark 1s many years ago. That's the reason we bought the yellow one more recently, because we know, we know what we like with these cars. They're just great fun little cars to drive, and uh, yeah, this is a Japanese market car. Very similar, but you can usually tell them if you can't see the badges. You can usually tell because they've got a different shape rear number plate. The, uh, the moulded piece here is set up for the Japanese slightly more square plates compared to the horizontal plates that we have in this country, so that's one giveaway. And the Japanese market cars don't have a standard of fog light, so any car that was imported, like a Japanese import, um, the, the new owner or whoever brings the car in and wants to register it has to fit their own fog light on the back so that's another giveaway but yeah Yunos Roadster is a Japanese market car and in America they're called the Mayata and in this country of course it's the MX-5 the MX-5 NA is the the official name for the Mark 1 everyone calls them Mark 1s but yeah NA is the Mark 1 and NB there's the Mark II. Oh, I've still got a few more cars coming in. Oh, I can see a glorious TR and an Austin Healey. We're going to pass this four-wheel bomb bug. Like I say, in the previous video we did towards the end of 22, I had quite a chat with the owner of this car. I think, from memory, there was about 100 or so made. Um, it was a company decided to convert the three-wheeler bomb bugs into a four-wheeler car, probably to improve stability somewhat, and I'm sure that was probably quite a rare conversion. We've got another TR coming in. Just going to stand over here out of the way. I want to have a talk about this Ford Ka in a minute as well. We saw this Ford car, I mean it's a 2002, we saw this parked up on the grass here when we arrived earlier. And I've long thought that if I had a barn somewhere, it's cars like this that I would be stashing away somewhere. The Ford car, the street car, and the other one, the sport car. Because Ford aren't going to make a car like this again. These early cars I think are really distinctive looking cars, quite neat styling. And, you know, they're probably they're not full on collector cars yet really but you know what an unusual looking car there's no mistaking it for anything else and they're just such distinctive cars i mean rust is claiming a lot of these now a lot of these when they get rusty they're probably just not worth spending the money on to have them fixed up which i think is a shame because they're a really distinctive little car and i just think they're really neat and obviously there's a little bit of tin worm on here which needs catching before it, it advances too soon because these modern cars with the thin metal, once the rust gets in, it spreads so quickly. So this is just an example, really, of the sort of car that, like I say, if I had the space, because they're so cheap now to buy, generally, um, you know, I think that'd be a good car to stash away for one day, because I think, you know, give it another few years, and these will start being really sought after, I think. Really usable little car, great for driving in cities. Um, assuming you don't run into local uh, clean air zones and all those uh, shenanigans which seem to be being foisted upon us at the moment but yeah leaving that all to one side I think cars like this are going to be disappearing quickly from our roads now and uh, they need saving the ones that are still here need rescuing and saving and preserving before they're all gone because uh, I just think they're very neat little cars very neat little design 
And I think there's a lot to be said for running a little car like this as a daily driver. Let me know in the comments if you agree what other cars from this era, sort of cars that are 20, 25 years old or so, what do you think we should be stashing away before they all disappear for good? I think the Ford Cat is definitely a candidate for preservation. What a bonkers little machine this Bond bug is. That's great. These are, are they Dunlop wheels? They look like the old Dunlop wheels. My uncle's GTM that he built, which was a mini-based kit car in the 70s, Cox GTM, that had very similar wheels to this on it. The A35 showing off its engine here, so like I said before, this will be the, the 948cc A-series engine, same engine as in the Mark 1 A40 that we've got stashed away at home, that hopefully one day will return to the road. And the A40 has a well it's been converted to an su carburetor like this one but i think originally well certainly the a40 came with a zenith carburetor as standard the mark 1 a40 had a zenith carb i think the mark 2 had an su now i'm guessing i'm trying to remember what our a35 had well we used to have an a30 but with an a35 engine in it um i've got a feeling that was on the zenith as well but i could be wrong i'll have to look that up when i get back home but this is a lovely car this is um, it's in lovely condition. We see this at many of the classic car shows that we go to around here. But yeah, I'm so glad I didn't park next to this. <laughs> it's got a period metal sun visor as well. Little blocks on the windows because they're pull up windows, no wind up windows in A30s or A35s. Like I said, my wife, Mrs. OCC, she ran a black Austin A30 for a few years, quite a long time ago now. That was her daily car, and uh, many is the time I went to go and retrieve it on wet days because uh, often the, the distributor down there would get damp. Um, the fan, what happens is when you drive it on a rainy day, the water goes through the radiator grill. And then behind here, you've got the fan just down there somewhere, and what happens is the water goes through the grill, and the fan tends to suck it through and spray it over the, uh, the distributor cap. So it's quite often hard to go and uh, go out there with a rag and dry off all the contacts and everything in there just to sort of uh, get things running again and we've got a very unusual looking car coming in let's go and have a look at that i don't know what it is wow <laughs> look at that indicators built into the headlamps we did pass quite a few american cars on the way over here but i think they were going off somewhere else but fortunately this one's decided to come here Sounds like a big V8 in there, unsurprisingly. Pre-war Ford, coupe, lowered roof line. Wow. <laughs> and there's another one I haven't seen before, an Austin Westminster. Not seen that one before. A big six-cylinder Farina. So what's that, an A99 is it? I'm guessing. Lovely six cylinder burble. It's a super clean car, this 635 CSI. What a beauty this is. A coupe sold alongside the seven series saloons, the four door saloons, but this is a much more rakish looking machine indeed, automatic. It's really nice, that is. The 6 Series, this was the replacement coupe. It replaced the E9, so the 3 litre CSIs and CSLs and so on. So those are the cars of the 1970s, but for the 1980s, it was the 635 CSI earlier that you could get the 633 and maybe a 632, I don't quite remember that. I know there was a 633 of the very early versions of the 6 Series Coupe and a complete with mobile phone, corded mobile phone. There's that lovely Austin Westminster we saw coming before. This is a rare old bird. If you've, is it manual, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you saw the photo collection that I did 
of the New Zealand scrapyard, the Horopito Motors, which I thoroughly recommend if you like photos of scrap derelict British cars. But in New Zealand, you'll see there was a ute version of the A99. I think this is the A99, but yeah, that's a nice old thing. Do you want to put my number in there? Yeah. If you do that, then you can always ring. Let's get in this shade. Rob. Rob. Over here we've got an Austin Healey 100M. This one came in before. Very, very rakish, sporting looking car of the 1950s. Louvered bonnet, leather bonnet strap, no bumpers. What a fantastic little car that is. Let's have a quick look at the history. Austin Healey 104 to M specification. Right, there you go. Built December 1954 as 104 left hand drive, exported to the USA and sold by a North American dealer to the first owner. It remained in the USA until the late 1980s when it was reimported to this country by a Cheshire businessman. Well, there's the history if you want to. Have a look, have a read of the history board there. What a cracker that is. I love the seats. Just walked into the roof of the building. Yeah, that's lovely, that is. TR4A. MGB Roadster on the T, so it's that 77 or 78, something like that. SLK alongside. Yeah, there's a bit of everything here today. Sports cars. The sports cars are really well represented today, actually. We've got quite a few saloons as well. Got a kit car here, which I think is based on the Triumph GT6. It's got a six cylinder engine and this glorious four cylinder Austin Healey 104. Next to the Vauxhall Sports Hatch is an MGTD. I only caught a glimpse of this one driving in before. Yeah. So this was the first of the T-Series cars that came as standard with pressed steel wheels as opposed to the Y wheels of the TC and all the sporty MGs that came before. And this was replaced by the TF and then the MGA. So this is a post-war car, early 1950s, but very much pre-war in style. Left-hand drive, so presumably an import, probably America, I would have thought. It's got a fancy GPS speedometer as well, so maybe it takes part in a few sort of classic car regularity rallies, that kind of thing, where precise timing and speeds and so on, regularity runs, it's all very important to know exactly how quick you're going, so that's probably what that's all about. And here, a very straight TR4. So we have the TR4A over the back with the independent rear suspension, this is the TR4 with the solid rear axle. And looking at these things on the headlights, it may well have been abroad in recent times, that'd be my guess. I do like TR4s, TR4s, 4As, TR5s are all very similar to look at, just slightly different details, very few differences, but they all look fantastic. And then you had the TR6 which came a little bit later. Well, these are very characterful little cars I think, as is this MGTD. Lots of little businesses are based around here as well. All the cars are parked, surrounded by lots of interesting little shops and businesses. So, hidden treasures, there are quite a lot of interesting old things in there. There's some stuff down here as well, actually. If you're looking for second-hand goodies to put in your house, maybe for the garden, or if you're renovating an older place, it's well worth popping in here. Got a chair there for £10. Bargain. This is one of the heaviest chairs I've ever tried to lift as well. Certainly a bit of everything furniture wise, so uh, if you're in the area, pop into Hopley House and have a look at some of the businesses that are here and support your local little business because, uh, you know, times aren't easy for any small enterprise at the moment, so uh, yeah, pop down here if you're in the area and see what you can find. I like the bag in the back of this uh, BMW. Complete with Concord bug, uh, baggage label on it. Here's that V8 Ford, what a cracker this is, and I do love the V8 emblem built in or incorporated within the mascot on top of the radiator grill. Well, I'm not into chopped cars, but it's certainly an eye-catching bit of kit. 
the huge V8. And what size is that V8? It's a five litre V8. And please do not touch the animals. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how much has been taken out of the roof of this, but it wouldn't have been quite that low. I mean, it's a stunning shape. I like the V8 on there. Yeah, incredible shape, such an eye catching car. These pre war American cars, just epic looking, I think. They just look fantastic. <laughs> And the bonnet's up on the Model A now, so let's have a quick peek under here. These, the standard engine on these was a 3.3 litre side valve. Oh, I spent many hours fiddling with the uh, this engine that was in my Model A, a truck. This has got an air cleaner on it, which I don't remember mine having. But yeah, all these bits are available, which makes them quite a, a practical ownership proposition. I remember chasing the water, changing the water pump. I was able to buy a new brand new water pump for it in this country which is uh, pretty incredible for a car that's what the thick end of 90 years old now so i think you know that's really quite quite impressive it's a shame the dodge wasn't here today that would have looked quite good part next to it but not to worry next time hopefully a uh, drop down luggage rack on the back here with reflectors yeah. a lovely step as well ford branded step Really, really nice bit of kit. People are starting to head off now, so I think we'll probably be doing the same before too long. Dad's still here with his B. This little A35 is still here, and I can just hear the Model A Cooper just fired up. Well, that's most of the cars gone now. We'll start heading back ourselves and go and grab a bite to eat. It's about half 11-ish, which is the official end time for this particular breakfast car meet. So uh, most cars have gone now. We've still got this glorious 6 Series BMW for company. But I imagine that'll be fired up before too long and that will be heading back as well. So anyway, thanks very much for watching this video. I hope it was of interest. We'll stagger back now. I think the afternoon will be spent fiddling with the Dodge pickup and see why. It didn't start this morning. Oh, these old cars. Who'd have old cars, eh?
Well, we're back home now. The plucky little standard did the job today. So it's redeemed itself if you saw the video of when we were booked in for the Audlem Transport Festival last year, 2022. You might remember that we took this on the Dodge Tour that we had at the time. And this was the one to pack up en route. And we had to abandon it in a farmyard and pick it up later again that same day. We all piled into the Dodge and carried on to the show. Um, but today it was this that saved the day, so that's good news. So uh, the battery on the Dodge pickup is on charge, so I'll just go and have a quick look at that and just see how that's doing. Right, so it's several hours after we tried to start it up. Just going to have a quick shift at the battery charger. Like I say, it's on 6 volt. Because even when we connected it, I would have expected the, the uh, gauge there to be drawing quite a high current you know, which is what usually happens when the battery is on its knees but it doesn't seem to be drawing a huge current I don't quite know how old the battery is it must be a few years old but I don't know what age that is so we'll leave it anyway for a bit longer while we're going to have a bite to eat and then we'll have a look and see why it wouldn't uh, it failed to proceed this morning at least it expired here and we weren't out and about when it decided not to start. Now I have a feeling that it could be something like the points have closed up. I may have mentioned this before, but um, sometimes the little, there's like a little fibre heel on the points. Um, and if that wears down, the point get, you lose the points gap and you don't get a spark to the plugs. I, I'm fairly sure the fuel side of things is okay, but you need three things for that engine to start on any petrol engine like this. You need a few sparks, which come courtesy of the distributor down there, and a the coil, which is up on the bulkhead up there. I think you can just see that, so you need the sparks. You need a bit of a fuel and air mix so that comes over from that side with a carburetor. Um, but there is a third magic ingredient you need. It's not just a fuel air mix and a spark. For things to work properly, you need compression. If you haven't got compression in the engine, it's never going to draw the fuel air mix across. So the sparks will just spark away to themselves, the spark plugs, but there'll be nothing to ignite. So you need the three things, spark, fuel air mix, and compression. Well, those three things, you should be good to go. As long as they all happen at the right moment, you get the spark at the right moment, the fuel at the right moment, and all that kind of thing are usually good to go. Um, so I can't imagine it's anything too onerous. And uh, like I say, the first thing I'll check after lunch is the spark plug and the uh, the uh, points in there, the, the contact breaker points underneath the distributor cap there, because I've, I've got a feeling that's probably where things are not quite as they should be. But we'll see, but we'll have a look. But I, don't, I don't imagine it's anything particularly serious. These things are usually fairly simple if the basics are right. And it only ran a couple of days ago. We brought it outside to put some fuel in, so there's no real reason why it shouldn't have run today. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll have a bit of an investigation after lunch. Okay, well it's a few hours later, so a quick sit rep, a quick situation report. Um, I had a look at the ignition side of things, the points. They all looked okay, there was a decent spark at the points, so I cleaned them up a bit. And, uh, and more importantly, there was a decent spark getting to the plugs. So I tried starting again, but it still wouldn't have it, so I'm in disassemble mode with the old carburetor. It's a Carter carburetor on these half-ton dodges. And it's a downdraft, it's an updraft on Big Dodge over there, but this is a different different setup entirely. So what I've done is I've removed the top, the lid of the carburetor. That's only held on with these four screws. And I'm having a bit of a peer inside. The float is quite an easy thing to remove. That's just held in with this sprung piece of metal that slides in down there. And that just that just pings in, like I say, it's sprung this is, so that just holds the float chamber in place, the float rather, in place, so it's all quite clever, so I mustn't lose that. But peering inside, I'm not sure if we can get some light on the, on the subject, let's just see if we can balance that. Right, at the bottom of the float chamber, we've got the main jet down there. Now, I'm guessing, because there's fuel in the float chamber, because at first I thought maybe the needle valve, which is there, is actually horizontal needle valve on these. Um, whereas most cars I've had, the fuel comes in through the top and the needle valve is sort of pointing down like that. But this is coming in this way. This is a fuel supply in. We've got an extra, like an aftermarket fuel filter on there. And it comes in here through the needle valve and into the float chamber. And as the float comes up, it closes off the little needle valve in there. 
but if I look in there it's very dirty there's a bit of grit floating around I'm not sure if the camera will pick that up but you can see if I just get a screwdriver there's a fair bit of claggy old muck in here you can see down there so despite there being a sort of rudimentary fuel filter on the pump the mechanical pump which is buried down there under this heat shield and a little filter here clearly there's been some muck getting in here and all it would take is for some of that muck there to find its way into there and you can see the little drilling just inside there so I'm wondering because fuel's getting into here so the only thing that could be you know, the only place really they could have a blockage is somewhere downstream and including the uh, main jet there so all I can think of doing is whizzing that out and blowing that through and just seeing if that rectifies things because uh, yeah, I mean, they're not very complicated things, these. You know, the carburetors are all fairly basic. They might go about things in a slightly different way from each other, but, you know, it's all fairly simple principles. So uh, I think the thing to do is go and find a little socket that'll open, you know, remove this. We'll take that off and just blow it through and just see if that improves anything, because uh, I'm sure it's only something simple. Like I say, we're getting a decent spark at the plugs now, and I've had all the plugs out just to clean them up. They were a little bit sooty, but they weren't wet. I was hoping that they would have been wet because that means at least the fuel was getting through into the cylinders but none of them were wet at all and yet there's fuel in the float chamber so it only really leaves the main jet and possibly one of the, the uh, drillings behind there as uh, you know there aren't too many ways it could really be blocked other than this so let's uh, go and see if we can find a socket and whiz this little fella out right well I've uh, have removed the old petrol that was in there I used an old rag and just soaked it up to get it out of there so I can give the uh, float chamber a good clean now I've had a quick route through the old socket set collection and I've found a 5 16 that's a nice small one this is really handy these really small sockets so 5 16 that's more for my own benefit as much as anything in case I ever have to do this again but what I will make sure is that I've got a 5 16 one of these in the toolkit with me at all times in case I have to do this while I'm out and about just in case I get another example um, of uh, what I think is probably a fuel blockage so I'm going to need two hands for this so I'll just go and whiz that jet out and then have a look at it well there's the jet now it's only a tiny little thing now I can see through it it's only a tiny drilling I don't want to lose the little washer that goes on the back of it Probably the camera probably won't pick that up, but you can you can just about see through it. But I will blow it through, and what I think I will do is I'll go and get the airline, and I'm going to blow through where the jet actually goes in because it could well be that there's a blockage somewhere between the jet and well, further in inside the inner sanctum of the. Uh, the carburetor so uh, let's uh, let's blow that through first and just see what that checks out like actually just by blowing it through it's made a huge difference i think the camera will probably pick that up now but that's a huge difference just by blowing it through so i bet you that's what the problem was well oh, that's looking a bit cleaner now i've cleaned all the muck out and i've blown through where the main jet goes in there, I just got a length of tube and blew through it myself and that all seems nice and clear so uh, I can't see really anything else to do other than pop the jet back in, float assembly, lid back on uh, and just give it another go really there it is, all the float back in again and there you can see how as the float rises this little tab just on here pushes back and that blocks off the needle valve which is just in there so that raises up fills up with fuel closes off the supply as you use the fuel this goes down opens the valve and more fuel goes in that's all it is and that's how most carburetors seem to work but the way they go about it like i said before is often very different but the principles are pretty much the same across the board well all back together fuel in the float chamber blown through the main jet but it still won't start. The plugs are getting damp now, at least so that's a slight improvement. Um, but again, the battery 
is starting to wilt a little bit now so uh, i'm never going to get very far if the battery isn't 100 percent fully charged so uh, i think the next thing to do will be just to leave it on charge overnight and then come back to it tomorrow and see how we go and just have another look maybe with a fully charged up battery it'll uh, just be enough just to get it to fire just to catch i'm not quite sure i don't know what's going on at all it's just very strange very very strange indeed